You guys might think cult leaders are terrible, but I think they're growing on me. I'm your host Yusuf, and these are 10 evil female cult leaders that changed history. Make sure to subscribe and ring that bell to get notified whenever we upload a new video. Anyways, let's get brainwashed. Number 10, Clementine Barnabit. Barnabit eventually confessed to 35 removals of life. She explained her connection to the Church of Sacrifice, an offshoot of a Christ-sanctified Holy Church congregation in Lake Charles, Louisiana. Clementine further claimed that a priestess of the Church of Sacrifice had given her and her friends conjurer bags, a good luck charm found in hoodoo, that would grant them supernatural powers and make them undetectable to authorities. This spurred Barnabit into committing her first execution to test whether or not the claim of magical protection was true. Her confession was described in contemporary reports as very self-contradictory, such as sometimes claiming to have committed the executions alone and other times to have acted with others. She named many of her alleged accomplices, but none were ever charged with the crime. Modern analysts have tended to doubt Barnabit's involvement in the executions. In their 2017 book, The Man from the Train, authors Bill James and Rachel McCarthy James argue that some, but not all, of the executions were committed by a serial ender named Paul Mueller, with others committed by copycats. Other than the fact that she had conjure bags, they write, nothing that Clementine said about the executions a, can be confirmed by any other party, or B, has the ring of truth about it. A great deal of what she said is demonstrably false. It's possible that she was just saying she was the head of this cult, but in reality, there was someone else pulling the strings. Number 9, Anne Hamilton Byrne. The family, also called the Great White Brotherhood, is an Australian New Age group formed in the mid-1960s under the leadership of yoga teacher Anne Hamilton Byrne. Anne Hamilton Byrne acquired 14 infants and young children between about 1968 and 1975. Some were the natural children of members of the family. Others had been obtained through irregular adoptions arranged by lawyers, doctors, and social workers within the group who could bypass the normal processes. The children's identities were changed using false birth certificates or deed pole, all being given the surname Hamilton Byrne. And dressed alike, even to the extent of most of them having their hair being dyed uniformly blonde. The group's headquarters was raided by the police on the 14th of August, 1987, and all children were removed from the premises. In June 1993, Hamilton Byrne was charged with conspiracy to defraud and to commit perjury by falsely registering the births of three unrelated children as her own triplets, but those charges were eventually dropped. She pleaded guilty to the remaining charge of making a false declaration and was fined $5,000. In August 2009, two individuals received financial compensation from Anne Hamilton Byrne after suing her. Her granddaughter, Rebecca Cook Hamilton, sued her in 2007 for alleged psychiatric and psychological illness. She alleged that she received cruel and inhuman treatment from Hamilton Byrne and her servants, including beatings, being locked in a freezer shed overnight, and being forced to take medications. Her award was estimated estimated to be $250,000. Number 8, Terry Lee Hoffman. Hoffman was born to poverty and sent to a Lutheran orphanage at 9. She was adopted two years later and named Terry Lee Benson. She was committed to the Parkland Hospital for Psychiatric Evaluation during divorce proceedings in 1971, but got custody of the oldest child. In the 1950s, Hoffman became interested in meditation, metaphysics, hypnotism, Silva mind control, and the writings of Edgar Case. After attracting a number of followers in the late 1960s, she incorporated her movement as conscious development of body, mind, and soul in 1974, selling lessons and private consultations. Hoffman also started a jewelry business, incorporating it as CD Gems. Followers were instructed to buy expensive, handmade jewelry that she would turn into powerful, protective gems. By the mid-1970s, over 100 people attended the weekly lectures in Dallas, Texas, and many more took Hoffman's printed lessons. Aiding them were God and the 12 masters, such as Jesus, who were visible to Hoffman. Hoffman taught her followers to avoid critical thoughts, negative energies, as they could prove fatal. However, passing away was not to be feared, as the ultimate goal was rebirth in the spiritual realm. Number 7, Bonnie Nettles. Nettles met Marshall Applewhite in March 1972, though where they met is uncertain. 
In his writings, Applewhite claimed to have been visiting a hospitalized friend when Mrs. Nettles entered the room and their eyes locked in a shared recognition of esoteric secrets. However, Applewhite's writings were prone to hyperbole or relaying everything as some occurrence of fate. Terry Nettles, Bonnie's daughter, worked at a theater where Applewhite produced weekend children's shows and taught in an in-house drama school. She has stated that someone got hurt at the drama school in the theater. Herf accompanied the injured person to the hospital where he met Bonnie. Joe Nettles, one of Bonnie's sons, wasn't entirely sure how they met or whether their first meeting was at the theater. Nettles agreed to perform an astrological reading for Applewhite. They had an almost instantaneous spiritual connection. Applewhite decided that Nettles was to be the sage, he the speaker. They left together on New Year's Day on 1973. Nettles and Applewhite established Heaven's Gate together as equals, with Nettles running the group and Applewhite speaking for her. Nettles claimed to have communicated with aliens about the next level and told Applewhite to tell their followers. Number 6. Valentina de Andrade Due to the high level of violence, their crimes reached widespread attention. The subsequent investigation was led by civil police chief Adar Maro. Initially, the slaughters weren't connected to each other, which led to many of them being abandoned for lack of evidence. In 1990, after the first investigations were completed, the Para police arrested Rotilio de Souza, a drifter who wandered through the city streets. Investigators truly believed he was responsible, but de Souza passed in prison under suspicious circumstances some months later. However, the occurrence of new slaughters with the same characteristics as the previous ones showed that he wasn't the perpetrator. Work resumed and other lines of investigations were followed. One of them maintained the existence of an alleged gang of traffickers who were kidnapping the city's children to extract their organs. For the police, the manner in which the cuts were induced indicated clinical motivation, besides the possible participation of doctors. The recent move of two doctors to the city caught the attention of investigators. They were Anicio Ferreira de Souza and Cecio Brando, who had moved to Altamira in 1990. However, expert reports proved that as they were extracted, the organs were unusable for transportation purposes. Without sufficient evidence, the doctors were released and the case went cold. In 1993, the researchers reopened the case and rearrested D'Souza and Brandau again. According to witnesses, these men participated in a sect called the Superior Universal Lineage, a mystical organization that, among other things, challenged the Western idea of divinity and preached caution in living with children. In a book called God the Great Scam, the sect's founder, Valentina de Andrade, stated, Watch out for children. They are unconscious instruments of the great scam called God and his evil collaborators. Number 5. Sylvia Mraz at some point, Miraz became convinced that she could receive economic favors if she offered human sacrifices to Santa Muerte. Motivated by delirious ideas, she orchestrated the removals with the complicity of her family to win Santa Muerte's favor. Miraz gained the following of eight members of her family, including four of her five children. The first victim was Silvia Miraz's 55-year-old friend, Cleotilde Romero Pacheco, who was found ended in December 2009. Cleotilde Romero was a local woman who sold popsicles. She had no close relatives. Miraz later recounted that she had told Romero to pick up a 20 peso note off the ground, and when Romero went down to pick it up, she struck her in the neck with an axe. She made an offering of the victim's blood in order to obtain protection on the part of Santo Monte. The final victim was Jesus Octavio Martinez Yanez, another boy. Martinez was the adopted son of Ivan Martin Baron Moraz, and therefore Moraz's grandson. He was terminated in July 2010. In this crime, Moraz held the boy in front of the altar while one of her daughters slaughtered him. A statement by prosecutors indicated that three children were involved in some way, at the very least witnessing the crime. According to one of Zoila Santa Cruz's daughters, Moraz had threatened to end them if they did not commit the crimes. The children were beheaded in the rituals. Number 4. Amy Carlson In the mid-2000s, Carlson developed an interest in New Age philosophy, which she grew increasingly obsessed with. By 2009, she started a group called Galactic Federation of Light with fellow New Age aficionado Amareth White Eagle. The group believed that Carlson was a divine being who was called a mother god and they adopted conspiracy theories as their theology. During the global virus, the group posted up together in Kauai, Hawaii, where they were met with protests and criticisms after Carlson claimed to be a Hawaiian goddess, Pele. However, in 2021, Carlson's mummified body was found in Denver after her cause of passing appeared to be from ingesting colloidal silver, a supposed cure for the virus that Love Has Won was promoting. Number three, Teal Swan. 
The jury is still out on whether Teal Swan, a self-proclaimed spiritual teacher and definitely a YouTube phenomenon, is a cult leader. She's admitted that she has all the spanners in her toolbox to start a cult, but denies that she's managed those particular ideas yet, preferring to see herself as an ethical, caring alternative to proper psychological care by professionals who know what they're talking about. Teal, a striking woman with a stoic, monotone voice, specializes in self-removals. That's to say, among her expanding grab bag of new age theories, recovered memory therapies, and claims that she can sense what all your organs are doing at any given time, she is best known for claiming, mostly through hundreds of YouTube videos, to be able to provide help for those having dark thoughts. Number 2. Ma Anand Sheila In 1981, Rajneesh appointed her as his personal assistant. In the same year, she convinced Rajneesh to leave India and establish an ashram in the United States. In July 1981, Rajneesh Foundation International purchased the 64,000 acre Big Money Ranch in Wasco County, Oregon, which became the site for the development of Rajneesh Puram Commune. She was appointed the president of Rajneesh Foundation International, managed the commune, and met daily with Rajneesh to discuss business matters. According to Sheila, Rajneesh was complicit in and directed her involvement in criminal acts she and a group of Rajneeshis committed later. By 1984, the ashram was coming into increasing conflict with local residents and the Wasco County Board of Commissioners. Sheila attempted to have both Rajneeshi candidates for the two open seats of the Wasco County Board of Commissioners win the November election. She had hundreds of homeless people bust into ashram and she had them registered as voters in Wasco County. Later, when the local election board rejected the voter registrations, Sheila conspired to use bacteria and other methods to make people ill and prevent them from voting. She had salmonella put into salad bars at 10 restaurants in the Dalles, Oregon. About 750 people became ill with salmonella poisoning. Number one, Ruth E. Norman. Ruth E. Norman, also known as Uriel, was an American religious leader who co-founded the Uranius Academy of Science, based in Southern California. In the 1940s, she developed an interest in psychic phenomena and past life regression. These pursuits led her to her introduction to Ernest Norman, a self-described psychic, in 1954. He engaged in channeling, past life regression, and attempts at communicating with extraterrestrials. She married Ernest, her fourth husband, in the mid-1950s. Together they published several books about his revelations and formed Uranius, an organization which later became known as the Uranius Academy of Science, to popularize his teachings. The couple discussed numerous details about their alleged past lives and spiritual visits to other planets. After Ernest passed away in 1971, Ruth succeeded him as the group's leader and primary channeler. In early 1974, she predicted that a space fleet of benevolent extraterrestrials, the Space Brothers, would land on Earth later that year, which led the Uranius Academy to purchase a property to serve as the landing site. Despite predicting that she would live to see the extraterrestrials land, Norman passed in 1993. Uranius has continued to operate after her passing and formed a board of directors. Thanks for watching. Leave a like and comment if you enjoyed this video, and we'll see you next time on Crime Time.